So you've had experience in Washington as well as in New York on Wall Street. Uh, we spend a lot of time, people get paid a lot of money trying to analyze these elections about what they will mean for investors. What's your experience? I think elections are hugely consequential for investors because there's a lot at stake here. Take, for example, tax policy. If you want lower taxes for wealthy people in business, then obviously there's one team that you want to vote for. If you want uh, lower taxes for working people and people below, then it's another team you want to vote for. Uh, there's all kinds of uh, policy decisions. We've seen an enormous amount of legislative activity these last two years, particularly this year, and that's the kind of thing that happens after an election. So, as you say, we've had a lot of legislation through Congress, this is the last Congress, and particularly given the fact that it was really evenly divided in Congress. So looking back, before we look forward, do you think overall that was good for investors, not so good? I'm not sure it was great for investors, but a lot of it was stuff that we really needed to do for the sake of our economy, particularly the climate change. I don't think we should kid ourselves, addressing climate change is going to be expensive for companies and therefore for investors but we have to do it. Uh, prescription drug uh, uh, costs, we have to get under control. So I think from an investor's point of view, some of this may cost them some money, but I think there were things that had to be done for society as a whole. Uh, looking forward to the midterms, we don't know what the results will be, obviously, but some people are projecting we could have a switch in the majority in either the House or the Senate, or even conceivably in both. Uh, if you get a divided government, uh, which is what that would be essentially, is that potentially good for investors simply because they won't do very much at all? They can't get much done and there's some stability. Yes, I think you're right. If we have divided government, it's highly unlikely, particularly in the run-up to another presidential, that we're going to get much done. Look, it depends what you think the alternative is. If you think the alternative was a Congress and a White House controlled by people who essentially wanted to make investors happy, then obviously that's not as good and vice versa. I, I happen to personally believe we still have huge problems in this country that we need to address, long-term structural problems like the debt and the deficit, for example. And having government frozen is not really the way it's supposed to work. You're supposed to be able to legislate every year, not just every year out of one year out of five, or four, or something like that. You oversee the investment of a lot of money, and not necessarily investing it yourself, but really overseeing people who do that. In the course of doing that, do you take into account which industries, which companies might do better under a Republican administration rather than a Democratic one? Sure. You can easily see, and as you point out, most of our money is invested through other managers who do actual stock picking and so forth. But we spend a lot of time meeting with them, as you would imagine. And yes, absolutely, they think a lot about what might happen in Washington, how that would affect the investability, to use a word that might not be a word, of different sectors, different industries, different companies. So sure, what goes on in Washington, I don't think any investor would tell you that what goes on in Washington isn't incredibly consequential for the economy and therefore we all pay a lot of attention to it. Um, uh, this week we had the Federal Reserve come out, uh, raise interest rates another 75 basis points. Uh, if you can compare and contrast Fed decisions on where we are on the 10-year yield, for example, versus uh, who is in charge of Congress, which is more consequential potentially for investors? Well, I personally think the Fed is the biggest game in town in terms of affecting the economy. Uh, I'm not quite a Milton Friedman monetarist, but I, I believe enough in the power of monetary policy to believe that it's, uh, it is the biggest thing that affects the economy. And by the way, it probably affects the stock market even more directly in a sense. When interest rates go up, it's the enemy of stock prices. They tend to go down. You've seen that happen this year and vice versa during 2020, 21, when the Fed poured all that liquidity into the market, the market went up. The old saying, don't fight the Fed. So I watch the Fed very closely and I think it is, it is far more of an influence on the economy than Congress. So, so uh, higher interest rates are the enemy, as you say, of the stock market in the short term. But doesn't inflation have something to do with the value of investments as well? If, in fact, uh, particularly when you talk about bonds, but other investments as well, if you've got inflation that really isn't under control, doesn't that affect your investments? It might, but, you know, inflation is actually good for some investments. It's good for what we call real assets, things like real estate, commodities, and things like that. Uh, it really depends, I think, a lot on what accompanies that inflation. If you happen to still be in a high growth or reasonably growing economy and you get some inflation, that can actually be a positive. If you get stagflation or you get high inflation on a recession like what we had in the early, uh, late 70s, early 80s, then obviously that's bad for investors. So no, nobody likes inflation. It's destabilizing the business. It's destabilizing to American families. But, uh, and, and therefore, it's not something investors want but it's not necessarily the end of the world for investors. You talk about tax policy, uh, and you also talked about uh, the Fed and what happens with interest rates. What about regulatory policy? 
Well, I could almost argue the opposite in a way, that you may see more activity by the regulators because they might feel like the clock is running out on their term in office or whatever, and they might want to get stuff done. I've been a little surprised in that I would expect a very robust regulatory environment out of this administration. They've appointed people to many of the top regulatory positions who are very much pro-regulation, and you can see it's starting to happen at the SEC in places like that. So I do think you're going to see a lot of regulatory activity over the next two years, regardless of what happens in the election. One of the things that this administration has said they really want to go after, if I can put it that way, private equity, using things like Clayton Act Section 8 and interlocking directors, things like that. They think that there are some antitrust things going on there. Is there a chilling effect on private equity right now because they also have other things that are headwinds for them? Well, the biggest headwind for private equity at the moment is the fact that in an environment like this, uh, deals tend to slow down or even stop. And you can see, if you look at the overall M&A volumes, how, how much slower it is now than it was, because the sellers all want yesterday's prices, the buyers want to pay today or tomorrow's prices, so you have a disconnect there. Um, I, I, think, I think the problem in, in general with mergers over the last really 20 years or more has been a pretty benign antitrust environment. And when I was in, when I was in the M&A business, you know, clients would come in and immediately they wanted to talk about which of their competitors they could buy. Mm -hmm. And th that game, I think, in this environment is starting to wear out. And, that, and, and so that relates a bit to private equity in terms of their portfolio companies. But I don't think private equity in and of itself is an antitrust problem. It's not as easy to raise money these days. It's more expensive you can find it. Some people have trouble finding it, period. Uh, does that mean that pri the private credit is stepping up to that? Is more and more the funding coming from private tra credit? You're going to see that happen. First of all, there's just less credit, and there's going to be less credit, fewer deals, fewer acquisitions, less credit. But yes, the banks have, I wouldn't say gone out of business, but the banks have become very leery about lending. The high yield debt market is effectively closed, and so in fact you are exactly seeing that private credit stepping into the breach, which is attractive for investors because it often you can get low double digit kinds of yields or returns on that. Obviously not as attractive for the borrower who's, who was paying you know, a few hundred basis points not that long ago. Is it attractive for financial stability? Because coming out of the 2008 crisis, we had a lot of regulation of the banks. We sort of know, I think, what's going on there by and large. A lot of money went into private credit. I'm not sure that's as transparent to regulators. No, and that's, that's a broader problem that we've had really since 2008 or 9, which is that the more you regulate parts of the financial system, the money tends to flow to the unregulated parts of the financial system. Having all that credit going on outside of the regulated uh, part of the economy is not ideal. One last question, this is asking you to be a soothsayer, which is tricky. We saw what happened with the UK pension funds when that, that mini budget came out. It was not good. But one wouldn't have thought the pension fan, funds were leveraged highly. And yet it turns out through some derivatives they were. Do you see any indications of other parts in the marketplace where you might not even expect leverage at all, but as the interest rates go up, it really puts pressure on some investors? That's a great question. The UK, is, my understanding, they're, they're, that whole pension thing was a very unusual uh, pro, uh, policy move that they did. Uh, I don't know that it's replicated here, and obviously the point is that the UK didn't know it was a problem until it became a problem. And so it, I don't think you know about these problems until they really appear. So I don't, I don't have anything off the top of my head in terms of uh, things that I worry about, but a lack of liquidity, rising interest rates does put strain on the financial system, and then something will pop loose.